Good evening and welcome. My name is Tafine Dean and I'm a member of Congressman Walsh's staff. Shortly, we will begin our panel discussion with opening remarks from Congressman Peter Welch and Congresswoman Karen Bass. We will also hear short remarks from our panelists, Susanna Davis, Stefan Gillum, Keisha Rahm, and Noel Ribey Williams. Thank you for joining us for what I'm sure will be a great conversation. If you are watching on Facebook, feel free to leave comments or questions in the chat and we will try to get to them if we have time. Congressman Welsh, would you like to start our discussion? I will. Uh, and first of all, I want to welcome my colleague, Karen Bass. And this is a treat for me and for our panelists to be joined by one of the great leaders in Congress on racial justice issues, among many other issues. But before I get started and say a few things about Karen, I just want to say to Karen that Vermont is a rural and predominantly white state. Uh, we're very proud of many things, including uh, Alexander Twilight, who was the first African-American to graduate from college. Mm -hmm. But we know that the challenges that uh, are now becoming so uh, prominent as a result of the activism of Black Lives Matter and some of the activists who are on, the, on, the, uh, on this uh, panel with us today, uh, are just significant. We've got activity in Burlington uh, where there's concerns about uh, policing. Uh, and we have, I think, a growing populace who after that horrible event in Minneapolis where we saw that officer for eight minutes and 46 seconds with his knee on George Floyd and where it was not just a bad person doing a bad thing. He was doing it with such casual comfort his hands in his pocket, uh, in the full view of his colleagues and of passers-by, knowing he was getting, uh, getting filmed. I think it really awoke uh, in, I think, many people who didn't fully appreciate that while everybody experiences suffering or suffering awaits all of us, the suffering that's been inflicted on uh, people of color uh, from the arrival of those first 20 Africans kidnapped from their, where they lived and brought to this continent, much of that is the, and then the slavery and the Jim Crow that followed, the systemic imposition of suffering on the basis of the color of a person's skin is what we have to root out. Uh, so we're engaged in Vermont uh, very much. Uh, to everyone, I just want to introduce my colleague, Karen Bass, who is really an extraordinary representative. She had, grew up in, in Los Angeles and uh, got a local education she, and, and did very well by it. And along the way, in addition to being a physician's assistant and creating an organization uh, in a community to try to deal with all of the incredible challenges uh, of a low-income uh, community, got elected to the state assembly and then became the speaker of the California assembly. And for those of you who don't know it, California is not only a big state, it is the fifth largest economy in the world. And Representative Bass happened to take the helm as speaker after the economic collapse that afflicted the entire country. And uh, it was impossible to dig their way out of it, but she did with a Republican governor. And uh, for that, she uh, received a John F. Kennedy uh, Award Political Courage. Uh, in Congress, uh, Karen is uh, one of these people who's like very tough, uh, very effective, but you can't not like her. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> we've got to put that, we've got to put that. And she works on everything from a, a, a foster child in adoption, foster children in adoption to racial justice. And this George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that she was the champion of contained elements of reform that many here had been advocating for years. And after George Floyd, she was the one who was able to knit it together. And the, the, the challenge of doing this was delegated to her by Speaker Pelosi. Uh, Karen is not only a respected member of the caucus, but she at the present time is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, which we many, many of us refer to as the conscience of the Congress. So we have with us a person who 
through her entire life history uh, has dedicated herself to the betterment of our communities, uh, has been involved throughout her career uh, in matters of racial justice. And doing that with all of the tensions that go along with all of us having to face the reality of the legacy of slavery and what that's meant uh, in our country and how we have to challenge it. So, uh, Karen, I want to turn it over to you and I want to thank you again for joining us in Vermont. And sure. by the way, I didn't mention, uh, we love Kamala Harris, uh, but Joe Biden had the good sense to put uh, Karen Bass on the short list. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter. And uh, it is my pleasure to be here. I said to Representative Welch that I wish, and I look forward to returning to Vermont after many, many, many years and knowing that there is some incredible energy and diversity and people are taking up the cause. You know, the rest of the country looks at Vermont as a very progressive state. We know that and we have that in common in terms of our opposite coast. And uh, you are very fortunate in your state to have someone like Representative Welch, who is just respected by everyone. Everybody knows that he is progressive, that he is a person that is guided by his values and is committed lifelong to fighting for social and economic justice. And that's why we clicked when we first met, because we absolutely have that life mission in common. Well, the world was horrified when they saw George Floyd, his torture and murder over eight, almost nine minutes. And you know, it wasn't the first time. We've seen many videos of black people being killed by police. And, but every time there was a video, people would say, well, we don't know what happened before the camera turned on. And maybe this person is a little suspect. To me, I don't care if the person was suspect or a criminal. I don't know when we would concede the fact that if you are suspected of a crime, you are arrested, you are put on trial, and you are innocent until proven guilty. No one should be subject to an execution in public because I don't like the way a person behaved or I felt intimidated by them. There were no questions when it came to George Floyd because you saw the entire thing. I have worked on these issues, as Peter said, for many decades. And I remember before there were cell phones and before there were video cameras, we were working to fight against police abuse in Los Angeles. And we had a really crazy police chief. People were dying because of chokeholds in Los Angeles. And our police chief held a press conference. And he said, the reason why so many black people die from chokeholds is because our neck veins are different the normal people. He literally said that at a press conference. So when Rodney King was killed on video, not killed, but beat on video, many of us said, and this sounds terrible, but we said, well, it's on video now. They can't say it didn't happen. Well, you all know what happened. I think after that, a few years later, when cell phones were invented, then we felt, okay, people understand now. But really, a seismic shift occurred with the murder of George Floyd. And we had activism in every state across the country, many countries across the world, all 54 countries on the continent of Africa waged a protest at the United Nations in solidarity with black folks in the United States. There is a movement now that is multiracial. It is wonderful to see everybody saying Black Lives Matter. Remember Kaepernick? I mean, that was a big scandal. And now that's, you know, you see the teams and the coaches and the owners, everybody talking about Black Lives Matter. And so I think that murder created a seismic shift in our country. And it was that movement, that organizing that allowed Congress to do the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, because a lot of the provisions of the bill, members of the Congressional Black Caucus had been trying to pass for years. But when that movement compelled Congress to move, then we put the bill together. And just a couple of points about the bill, I'm sure we will get into this discussion. One of the reasons why that police officer was looking at the camera in Bolden, like Representative Welch said, is because officers basically have immunity. The standards to prosecute an officer is so high, you can never prosecute them. Chokeholds are legal and shouldn't be. 
Breonna Taylor was killed because of a no-knock warrant. Tamir Rice was killed because it was a bad, bad police officer. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act deals with each one of these issues. Also, for everybody here that goes to a barber or a hairdresser, your barber or hairdresser is accredited and licensed. There are standards. There are no standards for the 18,000 police departments around the country. So the bill calls for that as well. The last part of the bill I'm gonna mention is the part of the bill that provides grants to communities to re-envision policing, re-envision public safety. When people say defund the police, I say refund the communities because what has happened over the years is that we have shredded the social safety net and when people fall through the cracks because of mental illness or substance abuse or homelessness, we leave it to the police to pick up the police, the pieces, and no police officer really wants to do that. So those are some features of the bill. I look forward to our dialogue, and I'm just really happy and honored that my colleague and friend invited me to participate today. Karen, thank you. That, that was very, very inspiring. Uh, first, let's uh, hear an introduction from Susanna Davis. And Karen, uh, Susanna is the state of Vermont's first executive director of racial equity. Uh, she, in, in, and she's been here since in Vermont since 2019 and is doing a tremendous job uh, appointed by Governor Scott, a Republican governor. And she is in demand all over the state to help us navigate this. And Susanna, thank you so much. And uh, I'd like you to say a few words if you could. Gracias, buenas tardes. It's wonderful to be here. I'm Susana Davis, Racial Equity Director for the State of Vermont. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Representative Fass, for joining us. Um, you know, I, I am privileged to be asked to do a fair number of speaking engagements. And every time I'm asked to introduce myself, I, I panic a little bit because I don't, what do you say, you know? I mean, you, you can talk about who you are, you could talk about what your work is, you could talk about what there is left to be done and truth be told, it, it's a weird mix of all of that. Um, you know, Vermont is a wonderful place. It's a small state, it's a rural state, it's a largely homogenous state. And so there's a whole lot that we could do to move the needle on inclusion and equity. And I think that by and large, the state has demonstrated that it's really ready for equity. Um, but understanding how can we do things differently than we're accustomed to doing them to get a different result, that is key. And the reason it's key is not because the ideas aren't there. To some extent, it may be because resources and funding aren't there, but a large part of this is fear of the unknown and discomfort with what we consider different from existing systems. And that's really important because oftentimes when we talk about bringing systemic change, folks who are comfortable in the status quo see that as radical. But I think a lot of us, I think everyone on this call would agree that what really is radical is recognizing existing inequity and choosing to continue going forward with it, seeing how harmful it can be. So, um, you know, it's, it's, Again, it's really a pleasure to be here. I know we have a long conversation ahead of us, so I'll, I'll stop here. But, um, but the, I mean, it really is just systemic work. It has to be done, not just at the federal or state level, but also at the local level. It has to be done with community partners, people who have letters behind their names, people who don't. It, it takes everyone. So i um, happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna. And next, we're going to hear from Stefan Gillum. And Stefan is the president of the Wyndham County NA NAACP. Uh, and Stefan, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing? Yes. So hello, everyone. First and foremost, I'm thankful to be here as well. I really appreciate you Congress people for you know, and get, you know, panning out the invite. I, uh, so I am the founder and current president of the Wyndham County Vermont branch of the NAACP. Um, I'm also a clinician studying, uh, uh, currently pursuing my doctorate at the moment and an adjunct professor um, at Antioch University, uh, New England. So um, those are the sort of the, some of the th things that I'm doing, but, you know, I really, appreciate being on this panel because I think that for the first time in a long time we're able to have some infrastructure here in Vermont that is specifically geared at black and other people of color 
um, but especially Black people. Uh, the NAACP has been around since 1909. It actually was started in 1901. Um, fun fact, I don't know if that's in the Wikipedia page, <laughs> but um, did make it to Vermont until 2015. So went over a hundred years without being on Vermont soil, which I think might be the longest lasting of any state. I think even Maine had a couple branches. And so um, I'm excited to be here. And I think that I'm hoping that we can grow more branches. We can put more infrastructure that is uh, black and brown owned and operated into Vermont soil. And hopefully we can have beautiful things come out of come out of that. So with that, I will keep it short and sweet because that's the kind of person that I am. <laughs> and uh, I will pass it on to the next person, whoever that may be. Thank you. Stephen, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Keisha, Keisha Ram is, uh, is a, she served in the legislature already, right out of uh, the University of Vermont. And uh, now she, uh, and she took a hiatus from that for some time. Uh, becoming a consultant on equity issues. And she's now uh, won a primary in a big way uh, to be one of Chittenden County's uh, six state senators and uh, the first woman of color to serve in the Senate. So we have to await the decision of voters on that. But a lot of us are pretty optimistic that that's going to be uh, what Keisha is doing come November. So Keisha, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Congressman. That means a lot coming from you. And I have to say one of the most important things that a member of Congress and elected official can do is just be present and available. And, uh, you know, not only has Congressman Welch been calling a lot of people of color, particularly black folks around the state to talk about what's happening. But when, you know, when I felt like I could add to the conversation, I just called his cell phone. I'm not going to obviously reveal that number here. And he picked up and we had a good conversation about you know, what's needed and um, a lot has come of that. So I really want to honor you, Congressman Welch. Um, Congresswoman Bass and, you know, Chairwoman, it's an honor. And as I said earlier, just to sort of make you feel fully welcome in Vermont, uh, I, I didn't become the, poised to become the first woman of color in the state Senate without a great upbringing uh, in your district in Little Ethiopia and Los Angeles. Um, and I had a lot of formative experiences there, including uh, what we might call walking while brown in addition to driving while black. And uh, I was arrested by the LAPD when I was 13 years old. Um, the first questions they asked were, are you Mexican? And are you sure you're not Mexican? And uh, my friend who's Native American and black and I were detained uh, overnight at the LAPD on a school night um, when we were trying to get to the store, um, you know, so she could get some floss or something a block away at Albertsons. And, you know, I've told that story multiple times now here in Vermont as we've worked on uh, bias and policing work here, just so that people understand no matter where they have that formative experience, most people of color, most BIPOC Americans have had a, a difficult experience with the police that has left them so scarred and so, um, you know, anxious when they pass a police officer that um, you know, it may not be a BPD, Burlington police officer or someone in Vermont who, um, you know, they have that experience with, but it, it marks them for life and it, it ruins the trust, it erodes the trust that we need to have in law enforcement in order to have safe communities. So I just wanted to say that and I look forward to the conversation and really honored to be here with you. Wow. Um, uh, thank you, Keisha. Uh, and uh, Noelle Riby Williams is a uh, student at UVM and has become a very active student leader in state leader on issues of racial justice. Uh, Noelle? Hi, thank you for having me. I feel so lucky to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I go to UVM and I'm studying health science. I hope to be okay. <laughs> um, and I have, I hosted the biggest um, BML protest after George Floyd's death uh, at the State House. 5,000 people went to that, so that was amazing, um, especially in our little Vermont. <laughs> uh, and then I also was a part of the Black Lives Matter raising at Montpelier High School, where we were the first school to do that with school support. So that was wonderful as well. And thank you guys for having me here. Thank you. Well, let's let's get the discussion started. You know, one of the Karen, I'm going to ask you and then have panelists uh, join in, but one of the 
challenges I think we face in this country and in Vermont was a resistance to acknowledging that there were systems in place that reinforced in direct and indirect ways uh, what, what racism. Uh, so a, a lot of people could react to uh, a denial of voting rights and were inspired by John Lewis. Um, the, in the visible manifestations where it was quite in many ways during Jim Crow legal, but where it wasn't explicit, but there were underlying uh, policies that made it hard for say a black family to get a mortgage uh, or for a complaint about police conduct to be heard. And I do have a sense that that is changing, that there is now a growing awareness, you mentioned it, but you've had to be contending with this all your life mm -hmm. and have. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about how things have changed and what ways of communicating are essential in order to make more progress. And I'd like to hear from um, our, our panelists uh, to weigh in on that as well, because you're on the forefront in Vermont and helping us come to a greater consciousness of what needs to be done and what injustices are there. Sure. Well, thank you uh, for that. One of the things that has been exciting to see in this new movement, as long as I have been doing this, I do not recall a time when people connected a violent act from a police officer with systemic racism. Mm -hmm. Now that is becoming part of our vocabulary. And for many of us, it's like, oh my goodness, thank goodness. We have reduced racism to people's individual attitudes. And that's why every time it comes up, people get defensive because it's like, well, are you saying this about me? When you look at it from an institutional perspective, then there is no reason for people to feel that it is something you are saying about them. One thing that we suffer from in our country is that we do not know our history and we don't really want to know our history. We only want to know about George Washington's cherry tree, which I don't think ever happened. We do not want to hear about the 300 human beings that he held captive and he was a brutal slave owner. We don't want to hear that. Right now we have a president who is a racist in chief, but he is actually trying to whitewash U.S. history even further by mm -hmm. outlying or his new executive order that says you can't talk about uh, racial sensitivity or awareness anymore. Each one of our systems you can look at and you can trace the historic discrimination in those institutions. How the suburbs got built. It was actually a law. You could not include Black people in the housing that was being built. Redlining were policies. Education right. was differently funded. So when you look at it from a structural perspective, you should be able to be more objective in how you view it. It's not just a matter of individual attitudes. One thing I've been telling everybody on calls and in these discussions, learn the history. Most people have Netflix, we're all sheltering from home watch the documentary 13th, which is right. about the 13th Amendment. And it talks about the history of policing in our country. As long as we look at it from a systemic point of view, I think we can say this is why we need to dismantle these systems. Let me just mention one that is a real problem. Well, two, COVID, healthcare, health inequities. We know that there's a disproportionate death rate. Well, there has always been an achievement gap between kids of color and white children. That achievement gap now is gonna be about as big as the Atlantic Ocean because kids can conceivably be out of school for longer than an entire calendar year, not just school year. So when we are past COVID and we have a new administration, we shouldn't just put the same education system back. That's an opportunity to look at racial inequity and address it while we put the system back together again. And we should look at each one of our systems from that point of view. Thank you. Susanna, you wanna talk about Vermont? And Susanna was in New York City before she came to Vermont. 
Yes, I, I was. And six months after I got here, COVID-19 hit and suddenly New York City was the last place I think I wanted to be. So I'm very fortunate to be here in Vermont. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that's happening right now around policing and criminal justice specifically in Vermont. Um, you know, we have the legislature doing its own actions. We have things happening within the administration. And at times that is difficult. It is hard because it feels like you've got parallel processes happening and it isn't clear, it, it isn't clear how much of each proposal can fit with another proposal. Which bills are gonna pass? Which ones aren't going to pass? What can we do by executive order? What needs to wait? But one thing that all of those processes have in common is the importance of process equity. Not just that we arrive at the right conclusions, mm -hmm. but that we do so in a way that's inclusive of the people themselves. That mm -hmm. we make sure that we have people with lived experience, their voices involved in these, in these issues. So some of the things that um, have been passed in our state legislature in the last couple of months include a lot of things around police reform, use of force policies, body-worn cameras, race data collection and reporting, which is so key for Vermont. Our state is 94% white. And so one of the issues we have, first of all, one of the issues we have is that a lot of places aren't disaggregating data by race because they don't think they need to. Mm -hmm. And those who are mm -hmm. often experience um, often end up with data that feel meaningless because of small sample sizes and they end up being rendered statistically insignificant. So race data collection has been really big in Vermont, especially with criminal justice disparities. And lastly, one of the things um, that was really key was tying state funding and state grants to local compliance. Because at, at the state level, I think that we've come a long way in terms of fair mm -hmm. and impartial policing. But at the municipal level, we still have a long way to go in, in mm -hmm. a lot of our towns. And so making sure, and it's not always because of lack of desire. Sometimes we have some departments that are so small, they don't have the capacity to do the sort of work that, that we might need them to do. There are a bunch of reasons. But at the end of the day, the state tying funding to compliance is a demonstration that this is a priority for us and that it is so important to us that we are willing to risk it all for us and for you because this matters and that's so important. I do wanna just add one more thing, something that Representative Bass said that I, I really appreciated was about, we reduce racism to the individual act and it yes. really obfuscates the bigger issue of it being systemic. And one thing that I like to tell people is, stop dwelling on the question of, am I racist? Or was that action racist? Or was that comment racist? Instead, ask yourself, how much racism do I tolerate in my day-to-day -day life? It's a better measure because we can all self-diagnose ourselves as not racist. But the fact is that we tacitly approve of a certain degree of racism every day as bystanders, as upstanders, as cogs in a machine. And so asking ourselves how much racism we're allowing to get past us every day is a much better measure of what impact we're really having. Are we moving the needle or are we just providing a friction-free environment for people who are discriminating to do their discriminating? Thank you, Stefan. Uh... Uh, you want to add to that because you know what I'm hearing Susanna say is that looking in in, in uh, Congresswoman Basse is that just focusing on the individual and is that individual racist um, is not is kind of missing the point about how there are systems in place that uh, produce an outcome uh, that has really harsh results and when you look at the statistics. It's compelling. I mean, even in Vermont with COVID, uh, Karen, uh, the incidence of COVID for people of color is like it is nationally, way higher. It's just, it's disproportionate. Stefan, do you wanna add anything to this? I mean, you know, well, look, you know, at the end of the day, what Susanna said is 100% correct. It's amazing to me as a clinician that when I see a client, I'm supposed to be looking at them and analyzing them systemically but we don't do that with our own governmental systems. We don't talk about ecosystems. And ecosystems and the language of systems ecology is important in these conversations and should be prioritized in these conversations uh, as Representative Bass uh, and, and yourself, Representative Welch have already said. Um, when we look at who we are told we are as people of color, especially black folks, and the niche that we are put into within our ecosystem, it is small. It is derogatory, it is oppressive. Uh, 
And we need to talk about it as a community, how we can actually expand that niche to be bigger and how white people play into that. So when we have, when we, when we talk about systems, I really believe it's good to use systemic language because if we were asking any other professional body, whether it be state or federal, uh, to do something, right? If, if you go to your doctor, if you go to your lawyer, whatever, your clinician, you'd want them to take a systemic perspective and look at the ecology of your life. And that's what we need to be doing as, as a state. Uh, we need to be using data, like um, quantitative data, but we also need to be pairing it with qualitative data and saying, what are these stories and how do these stories give these uh, numbers lay? Mm -hmm. Or right. are they going to be numbers? And so, uh, you know, I'm from outside of St. Louis. I grew up right in the St. Louis area. I have seen police brutality. I've had guns pulled on me. I have had police call me everything but the name that my mother gave me. Um, and I know what it looks like. I know what it looks like to black women. I know what it looks like to Hispanic people because St. Louis is wroth with systemic racism, especially when it comes to criminal justice. Mm -hmm. That did not stop in Vermont. I yeah. was over five times in Vermont. And so within, within a year at the same stop. So it's connecting those stories, connecting those lineages and saying the, black, the great black migration and other migrations did not just stop at the Bible Belt and a little above. They're here too in Vermont and we need to be right. ready. Thank you, yeah. By the way, um, Karen, I know when you were working, it's, you still are on the Justice and Policing Act, and you're working closely with Senator Tim Scott. Um, it, didn't he have many experiences similar to what Stephen <laughs> described as a member of Congress, as a U.S. Senator? Where Black man from South Carolina, he sure has. <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite amazing. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think that I think is a real challenge is the decisions about how to advance the agenda. And we saw with Colin Kaepernick, when he did, he took the knee, it was received as very provocative and disrespectful by, by a lot of America. Uh, and of course, he, he didn't get a contract. Now, of course, we're seeing that being fully embraced and even defended by some of these uh, owners uh, who, who wanted to fire Kaepernick, right? So there's always this tension between an act that has symbolic meaning, but is received as a symbolic, uh, it's, it's, it's received by others as being disrespectful. And I want to ask Noel because you've been so involved in, I think, a really wonderful effort in many of our high schools in Vermont to raise the Black Lives Matter flag, and it's in, it's generated this immense discussion uh, that's heated in both ways. But how do you navigate? How do you navigate that when you're advocating for justice and you want to be persuasive, um, and you've got to use good judgment about how best can we do that? Yeah, I think that's really hard, especially um, with high school kids. I think just knowing one that no matter the age you are or who you are, you can change and you are capable of great things. Um, and that racism doesn't just affect black people, it affects all of us. Mm -hmm. It's a system that is damaging to white people and without them even noticing. Um, and so I think you, I mean, learning your history is a huge thing to help um, break down just facts, pure facts of um, Americans and um, just, you know. Yeah. Yeah, like what we can do to um, better our, our lives and our communities. <clears throat> so I think learning your history and also representation is huge. We don't have many black teachers or black policemen or black yeah. anything. <laughs> um, and right. I think a Vermonter could really go their whole life without seeing a person of color, which is a really damaging thing. Because right. if you see people that look like you, especially for the kids of color, um, you don't really know your, how much you're capable of and what you can do and where you can be in life. Um, so that's representation is huge in, in all of that. Well, thank you. And I wanna ask uh, Keisha in a minute about the state challenges that await her. But I wanna go back uh, you, to you, Karen, because we both lost a, revered colleague in John Lewis. And all of us who served with him just felt the honor and privilege of being with him. But one of the things I think all of us 
were really humbled by with John is that we knew the violence that was inflicted on him constantly, whether he's sitting at a lunch counter, whether he was crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, he was walking into people who wanted to kill him. They literally did, and they beat him uh, to within an inch of his death of his life. But you and I both were around a man the years we served with him who was loving and forgiving and accepting and had not an ounce of bitterness towards people that treated him really, really badly. And my question is, how, do, how does one come up with that strength and that generosity of spirit? And of course, you know, you've had to go through so much uh, where you grew up and, 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 and to climb, not climb, but to become the consensus candidate to be speaker of uh, the, the state assembly in California uh, with all the perceptions that you shouldn't be because you're uh, you're a person of color or you're a woman, where, where, where do you get the strength for that? Well, you know what I will tell you, uh, I get the strength from my ancestors. Uh, you know, I remember after um, Trump was elected and, you know, we were all in our funk. I went to, I call it our museum because it took a hundred years, by the way, to build the African-American museum, a right. hundred years. And John Lewis was the one that sealed the deal. And mm -hmm. Bush 43. So I went there and you know, for those of you, I'm not sure if you've been to the museum, but it's worth coming to DC just to go to the museum. Yes. yes. I spent three hours in the basement and the basement covered the period of enslavement. The average American doesn't realize that the period of enslavement lasted 256 years. And a hundred years we had apartheid afterwards. I spent three hours on the, in the basement. I listened to every video. I read every um, you know, exhibit. And I walked out of there and I held my head up and I said, how dare I be upset because this clown got elected. If my folks went through this right. for 256 years, I can handle this. And I really do get strength from that, knowing what other people went through. And, and uh, Noel, it's nice to see you because I became an activist when I was probably a little younger than you. And so it's wonderful to see you there as a high school student. And when I was growing up and I watched the civil rights movement on TV with my father, who was from the South, he was part of the great migration that left the South. And, uh, and I watched those folks and what they went through. And at a very young age, I felt like, well, I have a responsibility to go grab that baton. And, uh, and we have learned, especially from this presidency, you know, battles that you thought were won, hey, this is a forever struggle. And so we always have to be thinking about the next generation. And uh, that's why I get so much energy and inspiration from looking at you guys. Because I know that one day I can sit back and be the wise old person. <laughs> because I know that there's thousands of others carrying that baton, but that's what keeps me going on. Peter, do you know that what we're voting on tonight? Do you know uh, we're voting on a, a group of our colleagues? I do, our I, I do, but you, you explain it. You explain it, because they won't believe me. <laughs> so. <laughs> Speaker Pelosi, being the woman and the leader that she is, she decided to take down the portraits of the previous speakers who were slave owners and who were part of the Confederacy. So she marched in and had them taken down. Well, so there's a group of Republicans that are doing this bill as a form of protest that she took those portraits down. And part of their legislation is saying that the Democratic Party was racist, the Democratic Party did this or that, as though we don't know that. <laughs> we fought to be a part of the Democratic Party. But the idea that they literally are going to bring up something to defend the Confederacy and to defend slave owners is just... All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. By, by the way, I saw uh, Bernie uh, 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 Sanders the, the other day and... Um, and I was talking to Patrick Leahy, and they both wanted me to thank you for the great work you've done. And uh, they, 
they've been great colleagues for me to work with. Um, oh, that's part wonderful. of the congressional delegation, but they're kind of jealous that I'm with you and <laughs> you're over in the Senate. Uh, Keisha, you're going to have a lot of challenges, uh, assuming that the voters do send you to Montpelier, which we're all confident will happen. But um, how do you see? You know, you'll you were in the state house before as a representative, and now you're going as a senator, and the level of focus on Black Lives Matter and issues of racial justice was, I would say, probably close to non-existent when you were there as a legislator and it's now in the forefront. And tell us a little bit about what you're anticipating and how that's changed. Yeah, th thank you, Congressman. And I'm, I'm just soaking up what the Congresswoman is saying because it gives me strength. And I often will say to young people who are doing so much of the heavy lifting, like Noel, you know, hearing from you, it doesn't give me hope because I don't want to put that burden on you that I just am passing this on to you. It gives me courage to keep standing up and doing the right thing. And I think that's what we all um, need to remember. You know, I have to say there were two events um, between my time in the House and now going back to the Senate that have really rocked Vermont and shaken us up from our exceptionalism. One was the more obvious election of Donald Trump and knowing that you know at least a third of, of Vermonters supported him and are still waving Confederate flags and Trump flags um, you know in our state. But the second is something that um, is you know a source of shame for Vermonters at this point, which is that the one black woman in the house uh, in Vermont, Kaya Morris from Bennington, um, was so threatened, harassed and um, you know and uh, mm -hmm. experienced so much um, violence and hostility that she resigned her position. And, um, you know, I think that really shook us up in Vermont. Um, I wish it didn't take that to recognize, you know, that we have a lot of work to do here and we're not immune simply because we're homogenous. You know, there are three sort of efforts that I was undertaking that, that Kaya Morris was undertaking that gained a lot of steam after um, the election of Donald Trump. And I'd love to ask you, Congresswoman, how you feel like they relate to your bill. Number one, you know, I think much more recently after the murder of George Floyd, we've been able to talk about police unions and contracts and independent investigation um, into use of force. And I introduced that bill, I think in 2012, um, and the union made sure it was swiftly put back on the wall and never got a hearing. And now we're finally able to talk about it. Two is, you know, because you talked about not being able to have um, truth, you know, not being able to have reconciliation without truth, essentially, um, you know, diverse curriculum and understanding our past, understanding who our slave owners were, and that, for example, in Vermont, we were an uh, intellectual leader in eugenics and forced sterilization, and that our young people need to know that so they know uh, the pain our ancestors went through and how current that is for people. And finally, acknowledging that in many states, um, just like in Vermont, kids with disabilities and kids of color experience much more suspension and expulsion, and so that um, policing starts young, and I know Congresswoman Presley introduced a bill um, to remove suspension and expulsion as a use of behavioral change, but those are some things that are finally gaining traction here, and I, I you know, I don't like to let the moss grow under my feet, so I just love to know how those relate to, to your bill. Oh, sure. The things that you uh, just described. Well, you know, uh, one of the things in, in the bill, by the way, is a, a duty to uh, intervene, and so it shouldn't be that it, like, for example, when George Floyd was being murdered, those other police officers were there. One guy was even, you know, kind of acting like the lookout. Well, so our bill actually makes that illegal. Uh, so he should have had a duty to intervene because part of what has to change in policing is that whole blue wall. You know, the fact that you could be a good police officer, but you know good and well, if you try to do the right thing, your life might be put in danger. And that's the way they maintain the control. Because, you know, and there was a woman in uh, Rochester, New York, a police officer who intervened when one of her colleagues was choking somebody out. She intervened to stop. She got fired. <laughs> and so that's the example of the culture that has to begin to change. And I do remember hearing about the legislator who uh, who had to quit, but one thing I wasn't sure about was the harassment. I know it came from the police, but it wasn't just the police, right? So, you know, others can speak up as well. I mean, 
Bennington, Vermont is a site where they were just painting Black Lives Matter on the street while uh, counter protesters had AR-15s, you know, essentially right. at their sides right. while people were painting. So it's still the scene of uh, some pretty deep racial terror actually. Um, and it started with uh, regular citizens, I suppose. And, um, you know, in many ways it was that the police department failed to intervene, failed to take the threat seriously, failed to investigate. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, it, there's now much more coming out about the culture of that police department and the failure um, to hold that culture accountable. So, you know, she uh, unfortunately felt like she had no local support. And even with the state support, it was a matter of, you know, well, stay there so they don't win. Well, they already won if nobody's standing up for her and she has to fight this battle on her own with a seven year old son you know, who's biracial being called slurs. So, yeah. you know, it. Um, I think it shook people from their slumber that Vermont is such a peaceful and non-racist. Yeah. Let me mention one other thing. You know, historically lynchings and the Klan, police officers were deeply involved in all of that. Right, that's right. Tafine, um, we have a few more minutes and I know there's some folks on the call that have questions. Could you, uh, 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 can you read us a few of the questions? Yes. Um, so our first question is from State Representative Hal Colston from Winooski. He asks, how do we hold law enforcement accountable and responsible for dismantling systemic racism in their institution? Well, you know what, Peter, do you want me to take that? Yeah, off? no, I think that'd be great. So yes. one of the things that was exciting about, uh, has been exciting about this whole new movement and when we introduced the legislation, what, what happened was a rippling effect. And so a lot of states, because obviously we just have federal jurisdiction, right? But even when we act on a federal level, a lot of times that serves as a catalyst on a state and on a local level. And so I would suggest that you look at the bill and see what you could do uh, statewide. So. Uh, one of the things that we try to do in terms of changing the culture and, be, and supporting police is calling for the accreditation and standards so that you can bring in training. You know, calling for a registry of bad police officers because one of the things that was happening, I have no idea if it happens in Vermont, the rare times police do get fired, abusive police, they bounce into another department and, and you want to stop that. The idea of the duty to intervene, you know, so that officers feel obligated to intervene and they don't just go along with bad, uh, bad, abusive behavior. So you might look at elements of the bill and see which ones you could um, implement on a state level. Thank you. Which parts you want to implement? Tafine? Yeah. Um, our next question is from Jen Kimmich from Alchemist Brewery. Diversity is essential to Vermont's future. What are successful ways you have seen historically for historically white places to become more welcoming and to build communities that support black, indigenous, and people of color? Anybody want to answer that? I, Karen, you might have some thoughts on that. Well, you know, the, the wonderful thing about uh, your state is to be proactive and to uh, look at that now. Now, I know many other states, uh, Minnesota, I think, is one, a few other states who specifically invited refugee populations to come in. And I'm sure some of those states have some very interesting experiences and lessons to learn from that. But talking about diversity and making it happen and being affirmative in your actions, as opposed to waiting for there to be a problem, and then you have to have all of the reconciliation around a problem. Be proactive. Think of a lot of ways to introduce history and culture and make it a normal part of life. And Susanna, just from your travels with the, all your traveling around Vermont, uh, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would say one critical thing, and I always tell people this, step zero is lower your guard and open your eyes. Because so much of this discussion breeds defensiveness Mm -hmm. And if that's the position from which you're starting, then you're not going to be you're not going to be willing to see things for what they are and to make measurable change. And the other thing that I would say is that there is a lot. So in the state of Vermont, there's a lot of um, there's a, a fairly high poverty rate, but 
in raw numbers, there are more white people in Vermont living in poverty than there are people of color in Vermont living in poverty. Now, the rate is very different, but the raw numbers have more white people living in poverty in the state. And the thing about it, right, here's the big secret that we're now going to say on Facebook. Low income white people have more in common with people of color than they like to believe. And so when we let go of that separate fates mentality, this idea that your struggles are different from mine, and we understand that we have so much in common and that often the gains that are made by people of color are almost always realized by white people. For example, the number one beneficiary group of affirmative action in schools and employment is white women, right? right. So all of the gains made by people of color in the name of equity also always benefit white people. The, the more that people recognize that and understand the business case mm -hmm. for equity, the more we'll be able to get things done. You know, and one thing I like to say for Vermont is, you know, we have wage inequity between racial groups here, just like in other parts of the right. country. If, if in 2015, Vermont had had wage equity, if we'd paid people fairly for their labor, our state economy would have been almost half a billion dollars larger and everybody in the state benefits mm. from a larger and more robust economy. So there's a collective benefit to equity. And so I, that's what I would say is that so few people recognize that I think it might have been Kesha who said it earlier, this affects you too, or, or perhaps it was Stefan. Um, you know, I think a lot of white folks don't get that racial inequity impacts you too. So coming to terms with that, lowering your guard, opening your eyes, those really are the first critical steps. And uh, Susanna, let, let me just add that once again, in terms of history, there once was a time when poor white folk understood that they had in common with black folk. It was very deliberate policy in the South that broke that up, forbid it. And so people knowing the origins of that, I think is helpful. It didn't just fall from the sky. Thank you. We're coming close to uh, the, this hour is going very quickly. So I wanna let uh, folks give final comments. And Stefan, maybe we'll start with you and then uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So first and foremost, I just want to say as one of the youngest presidents of NAACP branches in the country, that there are many of us out there and that they are fighting um, tooth and nail to carry on that legacy. I will say that there have been some things that I've learned from my other young presidents that are part of the Next Gen program. We call it the NAACP Next Gen program as we've moved forward. One of the first ones is that we cannot focus on replacing the leaders of these police departments and other respective criminal justice departments with folks of color and they're thinking everything's going to be okay. As we've seen in Minneapolis with the president of the NAACP branch there, uh, Leslie Redman, who had a really good relationship with the police chief there that you can be a great leader and a leader of color and your police can run amok because we have a history that is systemically broken and that is based on uh, police forces running, catching folks of color. So that's one. The next one is, is that we need to understand that there are three things that really breeds white supremacy. And I'll name them quickly. The first is that the enmeshment of white people in power that uh, disallows them to hold other white people in power accountable, right? And that's huge here in Vermont in small systems. The second is the use of harmless policy or seemingly harmless policies such as traffic control or a parking policy to really stomp out a lot of good work that folks of color are trying to do in states and probably um, uh, federally as well. And the last thing, especially here in that's Vermont specific, is old style government systems that we use, such as two people, three people, four people select boards that were really aimed at helping white men hold their power, right? And town managers and things like entities like that that played into that system. So we need to talk about how we're going to reorganize that because that system is not created for equity and that's just the, the frank reality of it. So when we talk about Vermont, that's a specific issue to us. Thank you, thank you. Noelle, you got a final comment and I think, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm talking to all the kids out there. I, I really think that they need to know, um, like ask questions, be curious talk to your parents, talk to your friends about race and racism, because, you know, the more you talk about it, the more will come out of those conversations and the more things you can work together on helping and creating um, the Racial Justice Alliance Club at the 
high school didn't just come out of anything. Like it was hard work and the Black Lives Matter flag was hard work, but you can do it and people are gonna be there to help you do it. Thank you. Keisha. Thanks, Congressman. So uh, someone just remind me of the great Toni Morrison's quote, the function of freedom is to free someone else. And <laughs> so I just really think about that as I am poised to become the first woman of color in the state Senate. And as we all blaze trails, our responsibility is to turn around and free someone else and make sure we're not the last if we're the first. And so Congresswoman Bass, you know, I just want to thank you for blazing trails and being courageous and uh, using your freedom and your privilege to turn around and create that freedom and those opportunities for others. So thanks so much. Thank you. And Susanna, thank you, Keisha. Susanna, and then we'll go to the final word from Congresswoman Bass. I'm also going to end um, with a with a quote. Um, Hispanic people are full of these. We have these like parable type things that your parents always use against you when they try to say, I told you so. Um, and the one that's coming to mind right now for me, because it seems like every time I read the news, I'm reading at the federal level, particularly at the executive, um, there's another thing, oh, we're giving this much money to Puerto Rico, you know, three years after a disaster, or we're doing this for the black community, or we're doing that for the Asian community, or we're doing this for indigenous people. And I'm reminded of a saying in Spanish that goes, el rio no sube con agua limpia, which translates to the river doesn't rise with clean water. In other words, you might feel this sudden abundance, right? You might feel your river swell and you think, well, this is great, but it always brings mud with it. It's never clean. And so it's, I, I say that it's, a, yes, we're like country people. Um, and, I, and I say that just to say that, you know, it's a warning. Sometimes when you're doing racial equity work, you are, um, tempted with what looks like good things, beneficial things for you. Um, and there is often a catch and there is often a reason. And so this is just a reminder for all of us to keep our wits about us and to remember that, you know, what, what sometimes feels like a good promise can sometimes carry um, some mud with it. And so it's up to us to be diligent and to be really vigilant about what's being presented to us and why. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Karen, I'd like to, uh, turn it over to you to give the last word, but I do want to thank you on behalf of all of us uh, on this panel, but I also want to thank you on behalf of all Vermonters for uh, the extraordinary leadership and the way you lead uh, on issues of racial justice. Karen? Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is such an honor and such a delight to meet the panel. What, what wonderful leaders that you have in Vermont. Uh, well, we all know that we're 34, 35 days away. We have got to do this. <laughs> we have got to do it. And so one thing that I would encourage everyone to do, since we're in this Zoom world, we're in this COVID world, all of us can do a Zoom call with everybody that we know from around the country and encourage them, one, to know how to vote in their state, so IWillVote.com is a place where you can go if you're not sure how to vote to make sure if you have a mail-in ballot that you send it in early. We have one more month for the census now. That's really important for Vermont. So all of those new folks of color get counted. <laughs> That's very, very important. They tried to end it at the end of September, but it's going to be extended until the end of October. I am really, I'm nervous about the next 35 days, but I really believe that we can pull this off. And as traumatic and as bad as the last three and a half years have been, one thing that this man has done, and I kind of joke about it, but it's actually true. He said he was gonna bring us all together. He did bring us all together. He brought us all together in opposition of him and it was an assault against all of us so that we understand each other's issues now in a level of depth that we didn't before, whether it's immigration or policing or the environment or this or that or the other. But we have come together since he has been in office and we've pretty much won every election that's been out there. We got to bring it home this time. We have a lot of work to do in 2021. And I believe that we can do it. So just thank you. I'm so honored to have been a part of Vermont for a few minutes. <laughs> well, you're more than an honorary Vermonter. Thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, and thank you to each and every one of you. Susanna, Stefan, uh, Keisha, and Noel. Good night. Thanks. <laughs>